One. This happened a week ago. A little background. I am a cosplayer and a fan of Overwatch. A few months ago, a couple of friends and I decided to do an Overwatch cosplay group for an upcoming con, and being the overachieving idiot that I am, I ended up volunteering to make the cosplays of five other people in the group, McCree, Anna, Sombra, Bastion, and Farah, for anyone who's curious. I'm also making Zarya for myself. Why am I sharing this? Because the sheer anxiety being brought upon by making my deadline is the only thing I can think of to excuse why I so stupidly ignored some pretty obvious red flags. So on to the incident. I've taken to frequenting thrift stores whenever I'm pressed for time with a cosplay, and can't make everything from scratch, since they're great to pick up some items for very cheap that can be altered to look like part of a costume. This particular night, I find myself at a nearby Salvation Army, with my mother in tow. She's the Anna in our group. I was going through the aisles trying to find pieces when I looked up and made accidental eye contact with an employee. He perked up and made a beeline for me, greeting me and asking if I needed help. Now this was a bit odd, as you don't really get that kind of customer service in this Salvation Army, but I figured he was new and overly eager or something. I explained what I was looking for and he led me around the store. We didn't find much, and I was ready to thank him and call it a night when he really quickly asked if I wanted to check the back. Now, I'd been in the back before while dropping off a donation, but I was pretty sure customers weren't allowed to fiddle with the merchandise. But since crunch time was looming and he had mentioned he liked video games in passing, I figured what the heck, he just wants to be nice and help a fellow geek out. Yeah, I know. The back area looked like a warehouse and had giant containers filled with things, separated by category. I was poking in one filled with hats, seeing if I could find something for McCree, when he suddenly spoke up. So what kind of boys do you like? Oh no. Now this particular container was pressed against the back wall of the area, and had other containers lined up against it in a row, making a sort of sea of merch to one side of me. All of them too close together to squeeze in between them. On my other side were some heavy metal storage containers pressed against each other. These two sides formed a sort of little alleyway of which this guy was now standing directly in the entrance. I should also probably mention that he was both significantly taller and wider than I am. Gulp. At first I tried to pointedly ignore the question and asked him if he'd seen any brown cowboy hats, hoping he'd take a hint. He said he hadn't, but he asked me the question again. Now normally I don't like the idea of giving a fake excuse to get away from a guy, but his demeanor was slowly changing from awkward to genuinely creepy. Like, it's hard to describe, but he was just a lot more intense and gave off a vibe like this was going exactly as planned for him. So I fumbled my progressively alarmed brain to choose between I have a boyfriend or I'm a lesbian. I went with the lesbian option. I'm not proud of it, but being openly bisexual, it feels like more of a half-truth and is usually respected in the city I live in big LGBT population. I have a boyfriend is usually met with... He doesn't have to know. Of course, this wouldn't be let's not meet if my excuse had worked. Rather than just accept it and move on, he fixed his eyes on me and asked, So, have you ever been with a guy? When I didn't say anything, he told me his name, which was unisex, but most commonly used for girls, and he told me that since it was kind of a girl's name, would it make it okay? I let out an awkward chuckle, but at this point, I was not just scared, I was getting pissed. However, odds were not in my favour if he got violent. And while I considered texting my mother, she had a cart and those weren't allowed in the back, a quick glance at the screen told me it had died sometime before I walked into the back area. Fan-fucking-tastic. The music was also pretty loud and I didn't think any screaming would carry out far enough to be of help. Luckily, right behind him was a container of shoes, and I acted quickly. I'm not scared of making an ass out of myself, and I let out this giant gasp and pointed, Oh my god! Those are perfect! Move, move, let me see them! I did my best to act as exaggerated as possible, and he was caught off guard enough by my sudden change in demeanor that he took a step back big enough to let me dart past him. He started to protest, but I grabbed a random pair and I turned to him, 
You know, my mother's outside in the store. I have to ask her if these are the right size. Thank you so much for letting me look here. And I speed walked my way out of the back room. He followed shortly after and spent the entire time looking sulky. I did end up buying the few things I saw before, but I didn't say anything or ask to see a manager, mostly out of embarrassment. While I know from reading this I may sound like someone in their teens, I am an adult, and finding myself cornered in a stranger danger situation was extremely uncomfortable and shameful. However, I probably will return to that location, and if he does approach me in any way outside of basic customer interaction, I am going to raise hell. So, creepy Salvation Army employee, let's not meet again. But if we do, back the hell off, because I'm not getting caught up in that bullshit again. 2. In honor of the Olympics and a recent discovery of this subreddit, I thought I'd share my experience. Hope you enjoy. It was early July, I was about to begin my senior year of college, but home for the summer. While at home, I met Lisa on Tinder. Lisa lived in the same town as my college, and invited me to come stay with her for the weekend. I happily obliged, because... that booty. The weekend with Lisa was great. We start dating. I return a couple weeks later. It's now late July or early August 2012. My housing for the upcoming year was going to be on our fraternity housing off campus. We had a main house, the big house, and a smaller house in the backyard, the little house. I needed to clean up the little house I was going to be moving into, since it was left filthy by the previous tenants. Lisa offers to help, so we spend most of our time there. The little house was stockpiled with furniture that people had left for the summer instead of taking it home. There were probably six or seven couches stuffed into a tiny living room, so you literally had to hop from one to another to navigate the room. We made a game of it, and made great use of them throughout the weekend. Sorry bros. To give you an idea of the layout, the little house was a ranch-style brick home with three adjacent bedrooms at the back of the house and kitchen and living room at the front. The front door entered directly into the living room. The side door, if entering the home, was off to the right, on the far side of the kitchen. In the living room was one large 6x8 glass window, covered with blackout curtains at the front of the house. Okay, so here's the story, it's late. Probably around 11pm. Lisa and I were tuckered out and we cuddled up on one of the couches to watch the London Olympics. She dozes off, head on my chest, and I am left there happily pinned down. Suddenly, the front door knob starts to shake. I'm caught off guard because it's summer in an empty college town and we aren't expecting anyone. It stops for a moment. The door knob shakes more violently this time. Thankfully, it's locked. As I prepare to slide out from under Lisa to investigate, three loud bangs against the door as if someone is trying to kick it in. Boom, boom, boom. Their attempt to enter has failed. Phew. I'm partially relieved, but still aware there's two other doors where they could enter. Lisa's awake now, delirious and frantic. What's going on? What was that? She yelled. I hushed her and told her to get up and go to the back of the house in a bedroom and lock the door until I personally came to get her. She refused. I demanded. She obliged and scurried her way across the couches and locked herself in the back bedroom. I run to the far side of the kitchen and make sure the door is locked. It is. Back door? Locked as well. Okay, we're all right. For now. Thinking to myself, weapon? What can I use? Shit. I wish I had a gun. Maybe the brothers left something. Shotgun would be ideal. I see a hunting bow with a quiver of arrows. No, too cumbersome. Keep looking. Golf club? Six iron, perfect. Everything is silent, aside from my pounding heartbeat and the faint sound of Lisa calling the cops from the back room. I'm standing in the kitchen so I have a view of both the front door and side door, white-knuckling this golf club when suddenly the side door knob starts shaking and there are a couple of bangs on that door. Lisa screams from the back of the house and I yell to the intruder, We're in here and we called the cops. They'll be here any second. Leave us alone. The banging stops. It's silent. Dead silent. We wait for the cops to come. Lisa and I are back in the living room on the couch. Two full hours pass. It's now something like 2.30am. 
and there's still no sign of the cops. I'm both exhausted from the adrenaline crash and angry that the cops haven't come. We call them again. Operator, 911, what is your emergency? Me, hi, yes, we called two hours ago to report an intruder, but no cops ever came. Operator, are you still in the home? Did the intruder make it inside? Me, yes, we are inside, they didn't get in, but I'm scared they're going to come back. Operator, watch your address, I'll have an officer go over and check out the area. Me, thank you, the address is 123. As I'm literally spelling out the address, boom, boom, boom. The front door is getting slammed or kicked again. I holler to the 911 operator. They're back, please help, hurry. Operator, officers are on their way, stay on the phone, keep away from the windows and doors. Lisa is freaking out, I'm freaking out, wielding the golf club again. And suddenly, <laughs> the entire front window, all six by eight, shatters to pieces. The glass is mostly contained by the blackout curtains, and I scream the girliest, most blood-curdling scream I can imagine. I stood up and start swinging the golf club wildly, hoping to make contact with whatever or whoever was coming into the house. Moments later, we hear sirens, and I can faintly see blue lights through the split in the curtains. A megaphone announces the police presence. They scour the area and eventually knock on the door. Apparently someone did try to kick in both doors and there were bootprints to prove it. The window was shattered with a malt liquor bottle. They ended up finding a drunkard from the trailer park nearby who had been roaming the area. I bought a gun the next day. The end. 3. This happened to me about 6 or 7 months ago. It was definitely still warm outside. I'm a 26 year old female and I work in a bar. And I always had to close so I normally didn't actually walk out the door to head home until around 3.30am. I didn't mind working those late hours most of the time, because my boyfriend and I lived just over a mile from where I worked, in a really safe part of the city, and I would normally walk or bike there if it was nice out during the day, and then at night I would just bike home. My boyfriend would meet me halfway and walk me home the rest of the way, or sometimes I would get a ride home from my favourite bouncer, Andy. On this particular night, even though my boyfriend had come up there to walk home with me, I was so tired that I just decided to ask Andy to give us a lift home. He happily agreed. And I am so glad he did. Andy was always the last one out of the building after closing up. Just so he could do one last sweep through and make sure the girls had locked all the doors, turned off TVs, etc. As he was doing his last sweep of the inside, my boyfriend went for a quick bathroom break and I went to gather my things from the back and told them that I would meet them out back. They would be coming out the back kitchen door since all the front doors were now locked. Because I wanted to smoke a cigarette really quick. I lit my cigarette, unlocked my bike from its rack, and then start walking it the short distance across the parking lot to Andy's truck, so we could put it in the back once he got out there. Mind you, this all happened in a short, maybe two minutes, while I was out there alone. Once I had gotten to Andy's truck, I noticed some kind of newer looking sports car rev his engine, and turn his lights on somewhere in the middle of the parking lot. Our bar shared a parking lot with a few other daytime businesses and a pizza place on the opposite end that also served alcohol. So they stayed open late as well, but still closed an hour or two before us. So I just assumed this person was some drunk stranger from the bar across the way, and thought nothing of it. By this point, my boyfriend had met up with me by the truck, so I knew Andy had to be right behind him, so I really gave no shits about this drunk idiot revving his engine in an otherwise empty parking lot. Before Andy had made it out to the truck, he must have needed a potty break himself. Sports car guy speeds out of the parking lot, slowing down just long enough to glare angrily at my boyfriend and I, then peeled out onto the main road. I think it's important to note that when this guy turned onto the main road, he didn't slow down at all to make the turn, causing him to fishtail and almost collide with another car. He was driving like a complete fucking maniac. It pissed me off that he was driving like that, but he was going too fast for me to even attempt to get his license plate number or anything. So again, I just wrote him off as some drunken idiot that wanted to show off his car to anyone who could see him. And they finally made it out to the truck, and after helping him get my bike into the bed and giving him a brief rundown of what the boyfriend and I had just witnessed, we got in and headed towards the main road the same way sports car guy had left just a few minutes earlier. 
As I said earlier, it was a little over a mile from the bar to my house, so this all happened pretty quick. We get up to the first stoplight, and while waiting for it to turn green, I see the damn sports car clearly speeding by a lot. I'm talking at least 90 miles per hour in a 45 miles per hour zone. Coming back down the other way until he sees us. Immediately slams on his brakes and whips a U-turn right in the middle of the street. By this time I had made everyone in the car aware that I'm pretty sure that was the stupid fuck from the bar parking lot, and that I'm pretty damn certain he is following us for some reason. And he agrees that it's sketchy, and floors it as soon as the lights turn green. Sports car guy wastes no time in catching up to us, and actually trying to run us off the road by scooting his car between the median and our truck and attempting to ram us in the side. This goes on for maybe 30 seconds or so, but it felt like much longer. Honestly, it was fucking terrifying, but it gets better. We were about to pass the last gas station before making it to our house. So instead of leading this fucking maniac right to our front door, Andy thankfully made a snap decision to pull into the gas station and call the police. Of course, sports car guy whips in right behind us. Great. If it came down to it, Andy was ready to confront the guy about what the actual fuck his problem was. Andy had his concealed carry permit, so he wasn't as worried about confronting the guy if he had to, but acknowledged that he was in no way bulletproof and had no intentions of getting out of the car until the police got there. Unless sports car guy tried to come at us. Sounds like a reasonable plan, right? Yeah, it would have been if it hadn't been for my drunk and now angry boyfriend in the back seat that just didn't have it in him to not get out of the car and confront the guy, claiming that he couldn't just let someone get away with putting the woman he loves in danger. Can you hear my eyes roll? I rolled them then and I'm rolling them now. Liquid courage makes people really stupid. I didn't even have time to try to talk my boyfriend out of being a hero before he had jumped out of the car and started running straight at the other guy's car. At this point, the guy had gotten like halfway out of his car his door was open and he was standing behind the door with one hand on top of the door frame, while frantically waving his other hand around like it was a gun. You know, how you ship your hand into a gun with your thumb and shit? Yeah, like that. And screaming at my boyfriend to stop, saying he had a gun and that he was going to shoot him. My idiot boyfriend didn't stop though, so Andy got out of the car and actually drew his gun on the guy to keep him from making any further movements in case he really did have a gun that was in his seat or something. Once Andy pulled his gun, my boyfriend stopped just a few feet away from the guy to wait for Andy to catch up so they could get the guy away from the car and keep him somewhat detained until the cops got there. My adrenaline is at an all-time high at this point, and I'm furious. So I walked over to the guys once Andy and my boyfriend got him away from his car because I wanted to know what the fuck his problem was, and honestly, I was tired of watching these dumbass masculinity displays. I really just wanted to get close enough to see the guy's eyes to see if he was on some kind of drug, since you can normally tell if someone is on something by looking at their pupils. I'm no expert on drugs, but I've definitely spent my fair share of time with people that were strung out on one thing or another. For the most part, anyways. That was the only logical reason I had for this guy that I had never seen before in my life, to be doing all of this to us. His pupils were most definitely dilated when I got close enough to see him, so I made note of that to tell the police and walked back to the car. As I was walking back to the car, I started to hear the guy profusely apologizing and start to explain something, but I was too pissed to care what he had to say. So I just got back into the car and waited for the police. After the three of us gave our statements to the police, they asked us to wait around just a few more minutes while they wrote everything up and got the other guy's statement, to see if they couldn't give us some kind of answer as to why this all had happened. We waited another 10 minutes or so and finally got our answer. Albeit still ridiculous, but an answer nonetheless. Apparently the guy was such a frequent flyer with the cops there that they knew his father personally. He had multiple charges in the past for DUIs and assault. I wasn't at all shocked by this, but then the cop continued on to say that the reason this idiot had tried to run us off the road was because of me. He had tried to tell the cops that he was hired as a PI by a wealthy man in the area to find out if his wife was having an affair. Apparently he thought I was the wife, all the way up until I got close enough to him at the gas station. 
for him to actually see me and realize that I was not her. That whole story was obviously bullshit because the police also told us that he frequently comes up with stories about him being a PI or in the FBI or something. And that was due to the fact that he wouldn't take his medications. Although I was kind of put to ease by the fact that this dude was just fucking nuts and hadn't been stalking me or something, it still bothered me as to how he chose the parking lot of my work and somehow knew to wait in his car until we closed. Oh, and that the police did nothing other than call this grown man's father to basically tattle on him and then released him. I mean, who just gets away with something like that? Especially with all of his prior driving offences. Anyways, I have since moved out of that house and about 45 minutes away from that city to be closer to my family. So I'm not too worried about running into this guy again, but I do worry that he is going to do this to someone else and it's not going to end as well as it did this time. So drunken maniac who thought I was someone's cheating wife, I would really appreciate it if we never crossed paths again. Get some help, man. Hey everybody, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to Three True Scary Stories, episode 274. Thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. You know, I've got to say, I'm a little disturbed that that guy in the last story there is even allowed access to a car. If he's that delusional and won't take his medication, it's disturbing he can even get access to the roads. But what do I know, eh? Okay, with that I'm going to head off for now, so until next time, thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourselves.